Good afternoon. Let's try that again. Good afternoon, class. All right. You can call me Mike, not Mr. Petrilli today. Hey, everybody. I am Mike Petrilli. I'm the president of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute and a visiting fellow here at the Hoover Institution. Uh, visiting means I get to travel about four blocks uh, over here, always by scooter now, whenever I can, uh, which, you know, it's a little chilly today, but I'm telling you, nobody else is riding the scooter, so they are super easy to find. I highly recommend that you give it a try. Have you tried them yet, Michael? Have you tried the scooters? Come on. Come on. It's a very free market kind of thing to do. It's a little, little chaotic. Uh, great to have you here with us today. This is, I believe, our fourth uh, event in a series that we are doing throughout this entire academic year called Education 2020. And the goal of this series is to try to inject some fresh thinking into the education policy and education reform conversation. Uh, those of you that work in ed reform world know that that conversation has grown rather stale. Uh, sadly, there's not a lot of political appetite right now for big new ideas in education. Maybe that's not all bad. I uh, certainly could argue that we had too many big new ideas in the last 10 or 20 years and that many of those ideas didn't turn out very well. Uh, but uh, there's also a sense that, as with so many other issues in policy right now, we're just uh, stuck uh, and that we need some fresh thinking. Uh, we'd also say that on the right side of the fence on education, uh, oftentimes our conversations about schooling goes right away to school choice. Uh, and those of us at Fordham and at Hoover and certainly myself and Checker Finn, you know, we support school choice 100% uh, and think it's a hugely important part of the solution to what we're trying to get done. Uh, but we don't think it's the entire solution uh, and that there's other issues that it's important for conservatives to engage on. So we have been trying to encourage that kind of engagement uh, throughout the year, bringing in some of the leading lights uh, from uh, the conservative side of the fence uh, to tell us about uh, some fresh ideas and fresh thinking in education. So super excited. We've got a double header for you today. I get to introduce and then moderate uh, my colleague and friend Ian Rowe, uh, and then Shecker will come up with Michael Barone in the second half. You know, the second half happens, starts at five o'clock, which means really there'll be no shame in anybody going over there and having a glass of wine or a beer, though a few, if you're starting early, that's okay too. It's five o'clock somewhere. So, uh, you know, Shecker, if yours is a little more lively, I mean, you have no excuse. It better be more lively. Yes, exactly. So no excuse, uh, but uh, I believe that our first half is going to be quite lively as well. So it is my pleasure to introduce you to Ian Rowe. Uh, Ian is a social entrepreneur. He, you know, that, that term gets thrown around, but he really deserves this title. He is the CEO of Public Prep, which is a charter network, a network of charter schools in New York City of single-sex charter schools. Uh, what, I think three all-girls schools and one all-boys? Four all-girls, all one all-boys schools in New York City. Uh, doing amazing work there. Uh, before that, he was at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He has worked at MTV uh, doing some of their public uh, campaigns like Get Schooled. I mean, he's had all kinds of cool jobs. Uh, and we are also very proud that Ian is a senior visiting fellow at the Thomas B. Fordham Institute, where he has been writing about the relationship between family structure and education. And when we brought Ian on, you know, we basically just said, look, we would love to have you write about whatever you want to write about, because you have on the ground experience, you're running these charter schools. We are here in the Beltway, in our bubble. Uh, we want uh, to inject more uh, practitioner voice on our blog. Uh, and very quickly, Ian gravitated towards this uh, topic, which is, of course, the hardest topic in America, the hardest topic in American education, uh, the third rail, whatever you want to call it. And yet I've seen Ian over and over again be willing to broach this very sensitive topic, uh, including in some rooms that are much less friendly to hearing some provocative thinking on this topic than this one. Uh, so we're excited to hear Ian talk about uh, family structure, uh, to talk about what our schools can do uh, to have an impact on the next generation and the decisions that young people make as they get older. And I think as well as what his own schools are doing on this front. So please uh, join me in welcoming Ian Rowe. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Michael. Uh, yes, yeah, so I have uh, named my presentation, uh, Measure What Matters. Um, I, like many of the people uh, in this room, have committed my life uh, to improving 
uh, outcomes for kids. Um, and if you're in the world of education reform, we spend a lot of time reviewing lots of student achievement data broken out by race and class and gender, geography. But the fundamental thrust of my presentation is that there is a missing factor, family structure and stability, that has been hidden in plain sight for decades. It's missing from our conversations, it's missing from our data analysis, it's, it's missing from the interventions we deploy, and it's time to bring this measure uh, to the fore. So I amend my title to be just measure what matters to measure all that matters. Um, but before I present <coughs> my thoughts on family structure, I think it's actually important uh, to show my family. Uh, that's a picture of my parents on their wedding day in England. Uh, they were married for 48 years uh, before my father passed away. Uh, and now that's my own family uh, with my own two children, Sylvia, Oscar, and Camille. Um, I share these pictures because I think uh, my family's cute, uh, but also because we as adults have the responsibility to teach the next generation about the rites of passage into adulthood that give young people the greatest likelihood of success. Uh, as Mike said, I'm the CEO of Public Prep, which is the nation's oldest network of single-sex uh, public charter schools. Uh, as Mike said, we've got uh, all-girls campuses and all-boys campuses uh, in the heart of the South Bronx and the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Our first school started in 2005. Those are uh, all girls uh, in the Lower East Side there uh, in kindergarten and first grade on the left. And on the right, uh, those are some of now our alumni who are in their freshman and sophomore year in college, going to some of the best colleges and universities in the country. Very excited about that. Um, so back in 2016, this is just a sample of some of the colleges and universities our kids have been accepted into and are attending. Um, you know, back in 2016, uh, you know, based on the success, we were th really thinking about the question, where should we grow? Where should the next schools be? Um, and in New York City, there's something called the Citizens Committee for Children. Uh, they rank uh, New York City's 59 community districts on something called child well-being. There are about 18 different measures. Uh, in education, the, the three key measures are early education enrollment. Uh, so that's a, the share of three and four-year-olds that are in early education. Uh, how you've done on the elementary and math state tests and high school graduation rates. So we figured that would be a good analysis to look at to really f hone in on where we should focus our new schools to be open. So of the 59 districts, the top five with the highest overall risk to child well-being well -being, were all located in the South Bronx. Uh, this table shows you just some of the metrics. So the difference between the, the district with the highest risk of child well-being versus the district with the lowest risk. So Hunts Point in the Bronx versus the Upper East Side of Manhattan, which as the crow flies is less than three miles away. But in, in Hunts Point, only 53% of three, or three and four-year-olds are in some kind of early education program versus the Upper East Side, which is 82%. On the Upper East Side, 65% of kids pass the ELA state test. Uh, but in Hunts Point, only 10.5% passed. And the numbers are just staggeringly low. The disparities are huge. 12% math passing rates in the Hunts Point and 71% in uh, the Upper East Side. So given these poor academic outcomes, it certainly seemed like focusing our energies in the Bronx was a good thing to do. So thus, at the end of the 2015-16 school year, we moved our headquarters, we moved Public Prep's headquarters from HIP Tribeca uh, to the South Bronx. And as a way to get to know the neighborhood, on a July afternoon, my team and I, we took a walking tour to get to know where's the local deli, the, the bodega, you know, where to get the best chili relleno. Um, and along the way, we encountered a 27-foot baby blue Winnebago truck that had all these people around it that were very excited. Uh, and on the side of that truck, vividly inscribed in graffiti lettering, was the phrase, who's your daddy? And it turned out that this was the, the Who's Your Daddy truck. It turned out to be a mobile DNA testing center. 
that charges about $350 to $500 to answer questions such as, you know, is she my sister? Uh, are you my father? Uh, demand for the services of this truck were so robust that a second Who's Your Daddy truck had to be added. In fact, VH1 has a whole reality show uh, on this uh, truck, and it's called Swab Stories because of how they take a DNA sample. So seeing that truck was um, pretty provocative, and it was just, you know, why were so many people pondering such profound questions related to their family? And just looking at the data in the Bronx, uh, the latest information, the non-marital birth rate uh, in the Bronx for all women is 63%, but in particular for women 24 and under, it's 80%, 80 um, you know, in a, in a given year. So I went back to look at uh, some other data, look back at the Citizens Committee just to see how, what were some other data points outside of just education? How, how were those relevant? So again, in the district that had the greatest risk of uh, child well-being, 60% of children were in, uh, in single-parent families versus on the Upper East Side, where it's only 13.9%. Uh, teen birth rate in the Hunts Point, 28% versus only 3.8%. So the question was, could these differences be playing a role in education? And of course, it must be said that being a child of a single parent uh, even in poverty, is no guarantee of failure, right? Indeed, we have many strong single parents in our schools. And conversely, you know, being the child of a married two-parent, um, in a two-parent household does not guarantee success. But the odds are overwhelming uh, for the child in a more stable home in a married two-parent situation. So could it be that the educational disparities between Hunts Point in the Bronx and the Upper East Side of Manhattan were not just due to geographic distance or race or poverty, perhaps differences in family structure as evidenced by the huge gap in the percent of children being raised in single parent families, could that be a major explanatory factor for why education outcomes have been so poor for so long? And asking these questions led me down uh, the path that Mike just described. Because in my research, I discovered that what was happening in the Bronx was a microcosm of what's been happening across the United States in rural and urban America. So this child trends analysis uh, shows what has been the five decade explosion of non-marital births um, since the early 60s. So if you're familiar with this chart, in the early 60s, basically uh, only 5% of all births were outside of marriage. Uh, and as you can see over time, the numbers have grown dramatically to be uh, almost 40% of all births uh, in the United States are outside of marriage. And in particular, in the black community, uh, non-marital birth rates are 70%, in the Hispanic community, 53%, and even in the white community, its net number is now 29%, and it has the highest rate of growth within the white community. So how do these staggeringly high non-marital birth rates and the ensuing large numbers of kids being raised in single-parent families correlate to student achievement? not just in the Bronx, but nationwide. And you know, five decades ago, uh, there was one answer to the question. You know, if you were familiar with the famous or infamous Coleman Report, uh, which was done in the um, mid-60s, it established something pretty radical, that family structure and home environment actually had a substantial impact on student outcomes. You know, one of the quotes, uh, you know, schools bring little influence to bear on a child's achievement that is independent of his background and general social context. And this very lack of an independent effect means that the inequalities imposed on children by their home, neighborhood, and peer environment are carried along to become the inequalities with which they confront adult life at the end of school. If you're in education, those are not great words to hear, right? Because you don't want to believe that the, all the incredible work we're doing in school is insufficient to make up for home environments. So in many ways, the last 50 years of educational reform have been an attempt to dispute uh, those outcomes. But it's time we need to revisit these words. This report also came out just a year after uh, the famous Moynihan Report, which really dove into uh, the state of the black family. Uh, and in his report, Moynihan wrote that at the center of the tangle of pathology is the weakness of the family structure, 
once or twice removed, it will be found to be the principal source of most of the aberrant, inadequate, or antisocial behavior that did not establish, but now serves to perpetuate the cycle of poverty and deprivation. Those are very strong words. When Moynihan wrote this report, he was squarely focused on the black community. And what he was trying to do was shout, crisis, crisis, crisis. Because at the time, the non-marital birth rate amongst blacks was only around 23%. Now, if, we've, if we hone in on a particular category, so you saw in the chart earlier, the non-marital birth rates have exploded across all races. But in particular, to women aged uh, 24 and under, the numbers are just staggering. So this is just from 2015. It's what I call the equal opportunity tsunami in that uh, there are about a million births to women aged 10 to 24 um, in 2015. 71% of those births were outside of marriage. Uh, in the white community, 62% of births were outside of marriage. You know, there's a reason for the opioid crisis and the, a lot of the um, deaths of despair that we are hearing more about. It just so happens that in the black community, uh, the, the percent of non-marital births to women 24 and under is 90%. These numbers are staggering. And on top of this, if you look at the census data, of non-married women uh, who had births in, their, in that particular year, 41% were giving birth to their second through their eighth child. Right. So what is the effect of this? What is the, what, how is this informing uh, what's happening with kids? And is there data that really uh, analyzes student outcomes to really see how all of this is impacting kids? So I went on a journey. I went to you know, New York State Education Department has an incredible online resource that allows users to filter data, you know, ELA and math and region state test, test data by school, gender, race, migrant status, geographic dis district, L status, economic status, and disability status, but nothing disaggregated by family structure. And I noticed the same thing in all other 49 states. I haven't been able to find it. I then went to look at, the, at NAEP, the nation's report card. And in, uh, again, an incredible resource. The NAEP has what's called its Data Explorer, powerful online tool that provides achievement data by grade, subject, and jurisdiction. NAEP must report out on special groups, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, gender, disability, and limited English proficiency. But yet again, nothing by disaggregation of family structure. So here's the thing, major social changes, particularly in the family construct, constructs in which children are raised, have occurred over the last few generations. Yet the categories of measurement typically used in public education to evaluate progress in student achievement have stubbornly focused primarily on race, class, gender, and geography. They exclude disaggregations by these same family constructs. This omission then obscures how this demographic shift might actually be an explanatory factor in all the other well-documented achievement gaps. So here's the thing. So maybe in defense of all these agencies, family structure, unlike race, for example, is not a static concept. Families change. Maybe it's impossible to create measures around a moving target, right? Wrong. There are other sectors that, have, have, that are now doing this work to break down child outcomes by family structure. So for example, in 2010, the Centers for Disease Control produced a report called Family Structure and Children's Health in the United States. Oh, by the way, this is just one uh, 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 piece of data that you can find by family structure. This is a college completion information over time. Uh, for two-parent versus single-parent families. But it is very challenging to find any other kind of student achievement data broken out by family structure. But in 2010, uh, the CDC put forth uh, what's called the Family Structure and Children's Health in the United States. And in the preface, it said, in view of the changing family structure distribution, new categories of families, such as unmarried families or unmarried stepfamilies, need to be studied so that the health characteristics of children in non-traditional families can be identified. 
this was a watershed moment because it demonstrates that it's possible to capture this information. And in the case of the National Center for Health Statistics, they identified seven distinct, mutually exclusive family structures by which they're able to measure child outcomes in these different categories, and then most importantly, different kinds of interventions across race, across gender, across class, that help to strengthen the environment in which children are raised. So, in the, so for example, they put out a report in 2014 uh, about adverse family experiences. So if a child experiences neighborhood violence, caregiver violence, caregiver incarceration, this, report, this chart shows the differences. As you can see, 3.9% uh, of kids, if you've got two biological parents in the household uh, versus one biological parent in the household, 3.9% versus 16.2% shows the dramatic differences by family structure. Over time, this information becomes enormously useful in trying to determine what are the kinds of interventions that would be helpful to improve outcomes for kids. Okay, so why does all of this even matter, right? Everyone knows family structure matters, right? But the blatant omission of family structure and stability as a measure of student achievement is not a victimless crime. There are consequences, the least of which is that diagnoses based on narrow data snapshots lead to narrow prescriptions. So in the absence of data on family structure, the void has to be filled by other explanations. So take, for example, very well-known research that shows racial disparities in discipline begin in the earliest years of schooling, like in, like in this chart. So black students represent only 18% of preschool enrollment, and yet 42% of preschool students are suspended at least once. And obviously, a popular explanation of this huge racial disparity is that the teachers are either implicitly or explicitly racially biased against black students. And because of this assumption, the intervention that's become uh, very um, um, widespread is an explosion in anti-bias training. But could there, is there any other factor that is worthy of study? So Pew, for example, did, uh, did some analysis this year just to find out what's the uh, makeup, what's the racial makeup of kids within family structure. And here's an example showing that many more black children are being raised in single parent households. Is it possible these differences in family structure are a much larger factor in explaining the differences in behavior that could be at the heart of these racial gaps? We will never know unless we have the courage to ask and then answer the question. Ultimately, we have to have the courage to acknowledge that family structure matters perhaps more than we have ever been willing to admit. It does force us as educators to think about what should we do early for children who are being raised in fragile families? What do we teach the next generation about the choices that are most likely linked to life success? And how do we supplement race, gender, class, and poverty into reliable metrics that use family structure? As Michael said, you know, I run a network of public charter schools, and we think it's important that we not be passive on this issue. Given that we know uh, that there are larger numbers of young people being born into fragile situations, what can we do as a network? Even though we start officially at kindergarten and now pre-K, what can we do to go back even further for kids who are not even yet in our system? So we created for the first uh, time and first of its kind partnership that we're aware of, a partnership with the Parent Child Home Program, which is a two year home visiting program where the 18 month old younger siblings of our current boys prep and girls prep scholars for two years have an early literacy specialist twice per week, 30 minutes per visit. That early literacy specialist will sit with the caregiver and the child to help build that parent's capacity to become what we call the at-home reading coach. How do you turn off the TV? How do you build a library at home? In fact, you get a new book every single week. How do you use walks to the store um, as an opportunity to build vocabulary? So the, all that happens for two years prior to that student then entering our pre-K at four years old. So that's one end of the spectrum of how we help kids today 
who we think are in fragile situations um, so that we can improve their outcomes even before they enter school. And then on the, uh, that's parent-child home program, and then on the other side, our graduating eighth graders, because again, we're a network that's pre-K through eighth grade, we've just created a class for our graduating eighth graders. It's called Pathways to Power. And Pathways to Power is all about ensuring our eighth graders have a framework for understanding the big decisions that they're going to have to make over the next 12 years of their life. Four years of high school, four years of college, and the first four years of young adulthood. There is data that shows decisions made in that time frame have massive consequences, positive or negative, based on those decisions. So popular um, uh, research that's out there is um, called the success sequence that shows that if one uh, completes their high school degree, full-time work, marriage, then children, in that order, 98% of the time, that child and their spouse and that child's child um, will be in the middle class or beyond. That's really powerful information that we cannot deprive uh, young people of. And so we're taking that step to try and incorporate that into our curriculum. All of these, we think, are steps that become more clear once there's data showing that family structure matters and that we, can't, we don't have to just sit back and receive it, but there are actually interventions that we can take to improve the life outcomes for kids. Thank you. Now I get to grill Ian all right. on all of this. Great, great stuff, Ian. Uh, so, oh, and I should mention that these great slides are all available on our website. Folks watching at home, they're right there next to the video, uh, the, the stream, and others can find it at excellence.net. <coughs> Yeah. All right, Ian, so let me be a little bit skeptical here. Uh, Howard Fuller, a great education reformer, sometimes likes to say that we in education reform, we have this habit of bringing a white paper to a knife fight. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, by which we mean, you know, let's say you're going to fight over school choice. The yeah. unions are ready to rumble with all kinds of political power and, uh, you know, brass knuckles uh, approaches. And here we are thinking, well, if we can just make the right argument uh, in the New York Times op-ed page, then maybe we'll win the day. So I'm skeptical that even if we had this data, it would change minds. I mean, this is a third rail. This goes you know, right headlong into the current zeitgeist. I mean, the whole woke moment that we are in would yeah. say that the real issue is racism, racism outside of schools, racism inside of schools. Uh, you know, you're, you're blaming the victim. You're uh, on and on and on and on. Yeah. Uh, so why do you think that having these kinds of data would actually start to change the minds, especially given that most people in education are on the political left? So it's a great question. Uh, and, you know, in, in raising the issue of family structure, I, I mentioned that uh, I wanted to amend the title of my presentation to be Measure All That Matters. Um, not to exclude a discussion around race or class or other issues that certainly affect the environments in which kids are raised, but to never um, mentioned family structure, particularly in light of the research that's been done over five decades and reinforced over and over again, is just disingenuous. Um, and so I think in defense of folks who do see the world through a prism of race or gender or class, if the only data that you're seeing mm. is disparities by race, gender, and class, it tends to actually just reinforce that that must be causal. There was actually right. a headline uh, in the New York Times a few months ago that said, when I see racial disparities, that must be racism. And so there's just no openness to the idea that there might actually be factors mm -hmm. behind those other uh, measurement categories that could be determinant. And so I'm hopeful. You might be right that if, even if we had the data that showed, for example, in discipline, that you had really compelling information people might be so entrenched in their worldviews that they won't change. But the hope is that good-willed people who see effective data that's accurate uh, and fair, as is now being done at CDC, I think will over time uh, prove that in education we can get different outcomes for kids if we change some of these interventions. All right, so, but, and, and then that gets to the next big question. A lot of people have said, well, look, uh, this feels like one of those things that schools certainly don't have any control over, and, and, and you don't. I mean, you have kids come into your school, and you don't control what kind of families they live in and what happens at home, and certainly what happens years before they ever go through your doors. So 
uh, the worry is that this is going to become another excuse. Schools are going to say, well, we're doing the best we can, given the kids we've got, given yep. the challenges they have at home, given this family breakdown, on and on and on. Yep. So what can a school do yeah. that uh, you know, doesn't want to, you don't want to buy into those, the excuses, so then, then yep. what? why does this matter? So it is an unfortunate burden because it, it has historically not been the case that schools had to carry the load here, right? It used to be that the, the institutions through which a child would learn the passageways into adulthood, they, they may have learned that in their own family, uh, they may have, may have learned it in their own neighborhood because they saw lots of examples of married two-parent households, they may have learned it in their faith-based institution, they may have learned about it in popular media, but all those institutions are not necessarily now reinforcing this message of what are the ways into adulthood that give you the best likelihood of success. So I confess that I am saying that schools have a greater burden to um, play in this interim period. Um, that said, we don't control the home environments that a child is in. But we do, for a nine-year-old, influence the way that they think about the decisions that they are going to make going forward, right? We talk about college completion all the time, mm -hmm. right? That, that it, is, it is well accepted that you should go to college. I mean, we are, we are, we are on it, mm -hmm. college and career even. Um, mm -hmm. But the data shows that there are actually a series of decisions made in a certain order that likely yield tremendously different outcomes for kids in poverty. So why in the world would we deprive the very kids who need this information the most, mm -hmm. who are not getting it from any other institution, and for me, that is uh, a, a burden that schools should bear. And I have a burden, it's, a, it's an opportunity. And that's why we at Public Prep have taken on the effort to show at least one, one example of how to do this. But let's let a thousand flowers bloom. My hope is that the, the implementation of some of this data would encourage more foundations, uh, ed reformers, to say, huh, that's an interesting idea. Let's innovate. Let's encourage other schools to engage in ways to ensure kids have this information. All right, so help us spend a little more time on that piece. So what does it look like at public prep? You are literally trying to teach the young people. There's this thing called the success sequence. It's been you know, validated yep. by these researchers. Yep. You know, that if you get your high school yep. uh, diploma, you get a full-time job, you get married, then you have children in that order, you will not be poor. Right. Uh, I mean, that's basically you're doing classes on that. Is that? So, so yes, um, but what's important is that we're not being prescriptive, okay. right? So everything in this class, the pathways to power, the first thing that happens is that the students themselves mm -hmm. have an assignment, which is where do I want to be 10 to 12 years from now? Mm -hmm. What are my individual goals? Mm -hmm. Everything has to start in the context of their own personal aspirations. Then the question is, what are the obstacles that you see that's going to keep you from achieving those goals? And almost always, the obstacles that are identified by our students, because they live in the neighborhoods that they do, are things related to whether it be not getting right employment or seeing other folks who have had births out of wedlock. Those things enter the conversation primarily because they're introducing it as the challenge that will stand in front of their aspirations. So then the question becomes, OK, what's the information we can provide to our students to help give them a framework for how they can make decisions. So we use the seven habits, seven habits of highly successful teens mm -hmm. as our anchor text. Okay. And we actually use that framework to embed data associated with the success sequence. Not to be prescriptive, not to say that you must um, take this path. Well, why not be prescriptive? I mean, Because life is not a guarantee. As I said, you know, being the child of a single parent in poverty is not a guarantee of failure nor is um, being a child of a married two-parent household. So life is not a guarantee, mm -hmm. but we want to ensure our kids know the rewards and consequences associated with different life paths so that when they come to make their decisions about their individual life, they know what the likelihood of success or failure is. Okay. Now, your school for boys is, is still just growing, right? Yeah, we're in the fifth grade. In the fifth grade, okay. It will so, ultimately go to eighth grade. All right, so you haven't quite gotten there probably yet with... with we would have the same approach with boys versus girls. So let's talk about that. I, I heard you uh, have give a presentation like this uh, a few months ago, and there was a back and forth, a young African-American man in the audience who said, look, uh, 
first of all, he expressed a lot of concerns about the success sequence. Some people have criticized it for, for example, uh, downplaying how hard it is for a young African-American man in this society, probably likewise for a young Latino man, to get a decent paying job with just a high school diploma, given that there's right. all kinds of racial discrimination out yeah. there. Uh, and that that's been shown in, in tons of studies. And so, you know, it's not like it's such an easy thing to go yeah. out into the workforce and get it, you know, that, that, and that by downplaying that, you're not giving those young people a realistic view of the systemic racism they're going to hit yeah. out there in the real world. Yeah. Uh, so how, how do you think about that? So, uh, so a couple things. First of all, if I'm a young uh, white male in West Virginia, it's pretty hard to get a job too, right? So one of the things that's important to recognize is that these issues aren't just about race. It's not just about black kids. There's a lot of pain um, in the white community too, as, as those non-marital birth rates um, indicated. So that's, so that's really important to de-race this to some degree mm -hmm. to recognize that this is a universal issue, which is one of the reasons family structure is such a powerful um, achievement, a category, because it transcends all these um, issues. That said, no question that, um, of course it's not easy. Uh, so let's say you are a black kid that's facing racial discrimination. What do you think your chances are better? That you should have a child, um, that you should not f you finish the success, success sequence, that you actually think your chances are better? Mm -hmm. The whole point is, how do we equip our kids with the information that gives them the best likelihood of success and knowledge of the decisions that are going to have huge impacts one way or the other. I did an event a few months ago, some research um, was focused on the economic success of black men in America, because there's actually a pretty strong uh, component of successful black men. And the reverse, the reverse integration analysis showed that many of these black men had a few things in common. One was the general elements of the success sequence. They'd finished their education, they'd had a full-time job, they'd had marriage, married and had children. There were a few other elements. The military mm -hmm. was a component, a, f a commitment to a faith relationship, mm -hmm. and then finally this idea that they had a sense of personal agency, that they felt that their decisions could control their destiny. And that's one of the things that we're trying to put in the hands of our kids, that if you hear over and over and over again that instructional racism is going to dictate your outcomes, you no longer believe that you've got control of your own life. Mm -hmm. By teaching this, and, by, and not being prescriptive, but, but by saying, here's the layout of all the paths. Mm -hmm. You have it within your locus of control to make these decisions, and you know that these decisions are most correlated to life success. We have to trust our kids that they will know the best decisions for themselves if given the right information. We're going to get the audience in here in just a moment, so start thinking about your questions. And if you are watching online, you can tweet them to hashtag Ed2020, and I will look at my magic box and, uh, <laughs> and ask them to end. All right, well, let, let's talk. Uh, so I asked about the young men and the, some of the perspective. So the young women that you're working with, a couple of questions. First of all, isn't this hard to do given that many of them are coming from single parent yes. families? Like, how does that feel to them? Does it feel like a criticism of their own? So we're still early in doing this, but this is hard. I mean, this, th these topics are explosive, as you've mentioned. So the first thing is you've got to spend time with families to let them know why it is that we are doing this in the first place. And certainly our anecdotal evidence is that particularly our moms who didn't follow the success mm -hmm. sequence in their own life are absolutely supportive of letting their children know of the different pathways and the different likelihoods of success or failure. Our parents don't want their kids to follow the same lives that they um, have pursued. And so we're not trying to blame the victim. We're not trying to make uh, kids feel bad. But it is absolutely true that and if you're going to go in this direction, you have to build a great level of trust with your families and your kids that this isn't an indictment of the decisions that you may have made in your own life, but that this is the information that's out there that your kid needs to know because given all the challenges that we know that they're going to face, we don't want to add more impediments to them. In fact, we want to give them the tools that make them more likely to be successful. And we can't talk about this topic without talking about sex. <laughs> I, I love doing that at Hoover. Uh, the, uh, uh, <laughs> so uh, birth control. I mean, is mm -hmm. this uh, that, that clearly, you know, that if you want to say that you're going to follow the success sequence, one thing that can help is to make sure that, the, you know, there's not 
the issue of teenage pregnancy, or even yeah. in the early 20s when, when young women are still finishing their educations. Yep. Uh, this intersects with this question, mm -hmm. and, uh, and again, how do families feel about broaching those topics? Well, what's interesting is that those are topics we already cover in other aspects of our curriculum. So it, yeah. in some ways, that uh, topic is, is it's, almost, it's almost already accepted that we're talking about those issues. Mm -hmm. The Pathways to Power class, though, is actually not the focus. Mm -hmm. This is more about developing an economic framework for life decision making. Mm -hmm. How are you going to be successful? How are you going to hit those goals 12 years from now? Mm -hmm. And there is a sequence, not the only sequence, but there is a pathway that's more correlated to success. So first, what are your goals? How are you going to get there? There is an educational component. There's a work component. And if you choose to do so, marriage, then children. Mm -hmm. And we think that that um, doesn't get you bogged down in the discussions about birth control, mm -hmm. um, where obviously that is an, an element. Uh, but this larger arc to your life is something that we really want to impart to our kids. Okay. All right. Let's start with some questions. Uh, raise your hand if you've got one. We'll bring a mic around for the webcast and tell us who you are, where you're from. Ask a question. Don't make a speech. Uh, checker. Sorry. I, nobody else raised their hand All yet, right. so I may kick off with a relatively simple one, which is really just methodology. How did the health people get data on family structure. Uh, what do you put in the survey? I think the census does ask when it uh, finds a person, are you married or not? Uh, but I don't know how you would work this methodologically into the way we gather education data. Any thoughts on that? So I, so I am not a statistician, but my hope is that by presenting that there are other sectors that are actually tracking information, such as CDC, that there becomes a mechanism um, within education. I know the folks uh, uh, at, at, at NAEP have been looking at this. There are ways to get at this information. There, there just is. Um, even if a child's situation can vary from year to year, so it's not completely static. But the, the benefit of having that information, I think, is worth, worthy of us understanding. How is it that the National Center for Health Statistics has gotten this data? How are other sectors, whether it be poverty arena, you, you can look at a whole bunch of other sectors that have data incarceration that um, measure child outcomes or likely child outcomes based on family structure. And that data just does not exist in education. Excuse the mic. Michael Barone Good. with American Enterprise Institute and the Washington Examiner. Does the CDC data show striking differences oh, in? Yeah results. Yes. And I gather it's your expectation that if we uh, could get this data on education, um, that would probably do so, that you would see some striking differences there. We got we to gotta, uh, trust the data, but I have a almost 100 percent certainty that we would see strikingly positive outcomes for uh, kids married to parent households versus other structures. And the reason that that is important is that that may then shift the conversation to say, every disparity we see by these other well-documented gaps, maybe they're explained by something else. Sultan at this point, but a longtime educator, I would posit that most teachers, in fact, know which children are coming from single-parent families. I think the difference may be that you're addressing this head on with a set of strategies rather than that nobody in education knows this and therefore the data would be helpful. Is that what you think or? I think people, I think people actually know it intuitively and in fact the vast majority of educators I know have practiced the success sequence in their own life, right? But heaven forbid we actually talk about this in classrooms because then we're imposing middle class values or, or things, you know, we can't talk about this uh, with kids. So again, my hope is that all of this gives um, educators, funders, philanthropists more permission to talk about this, that obviously family structure matters a lot to the outcomes for kids. And there may be a reason that we see flat data for NAEP. Like there may be that all these interventions that we've tried have gotten us to a certain level but the family structure data that Moynihan and, and Yuri Bronfenbrenner and Coleman wrote about many, many years ago 
maybe that is the missing factor. I mean, do you think, Ian, is this something we should be talking about separately from, say, college readiness? Or can't we say that this is, we're concerned about college readiness, not just four-year colleges, but two-year and other mm -hmm. kinds too, any kind of post-secondary training. It is one of the major reasons that young people, especially young women, don't make it through. Oh, yeah. Uh, is because of a pregnancy. And oh, so yeah. this is, you know, part, we can be a part of that conversation is to say, look. A absolutely. Or, or to say, look, the, the data show very clearly that upper middle class kids today are waiting until their mid to late 20s, if not later, to, to get married and start families. And that, that allows you time to get through all this education that's so powerful in this new economy. We just, that, that's part of the conversation. There's no question that the divide is definitely family structures now a more powerful divide than race, class, and these other items. It just is. And, and for us, again, to deny kids access to this information is just irresponsible. It's disingenuous. The very kids that need it the most, because they're not getting this message from other institutions, need to hear it from the one institution that actually has access to kids at least 10 months a year. All right, via Twitter, Dale Chu asks, if Ian was the state chief in New York, what would be the first steps he would take to ensure that the teaching of personal responsibility was more sustainable? Uh, was, was wow, if I was the chief state of New York, first I'd, I'd, I'd bring back the, the social studies test <laughs> so, so that the real content taught in schools. But that's a, We're covering that's a, that in another, uh, right, that's another, another That's another presentation. Um, I would probably create uh, financial incentives to encourage schools to adopt this curriculum. I think we're not, uh, I think we're not yet at the stage where any, setting any kind of mandate mm -hmm. would be received well. I would certainly have a, a two tracks. First track is, let's look at all this incredible information we have about student achievement data, and I would try to start supplementing Checker's um, question, which is, how can we start collecting information by grade um, so that we actually have information by family structure? I think you've got to lead with the data. So that's thing one. And then thing two would be, I would create incentives. There should be a lot of schools attempting, particularly at eighth grade, as, as eighth graders are now entering the you know, high school, college, those are, those, are, those are times when you need a greater foundation of what's the information I need to make good, healthy decisions, especially if the environment around you is leading you not to make good decisions. So those, are the, those would be two of the things I would Well, do. and it's interesting. I mean, you, you joke about social studies tests, but, you know, there is this link here. Jonah Goldberg was here at our last event talking about the way that we teach history in this country, the sort of Howard Zinn approach that focuses oh. entirely on you know the the huge uh, sins of our country yep. but not at all about the triumphs that we've right. had overcoming many of those uh, sins and and that that leaves our young people with this view of America as just being this you know horribly again racist classist yep. evil place uh, rather than you right. know showing the whole story and, and again that that's part of it that if you want to tell that you know our schools play this important role of telling our young people here's Here's the civilization you're coming into, and if we don't give the story that says, yes, there's still these vestiges of, of yep. racism and classes, but, you know, you look at all these people that have overcome it. I mean, America is a combination of rights and responsibilities, and the responsibilities here to Ford did include things like family, uh, uh, faith, um, and those things are important for kids to know that... Uh, going to be something expected of them in terms of the personal decisions that they make which will make it more likely to live the American dream. Love it. Okay, one last question. And then it's halftime. You All know right. What that means. Okay. I will finish up then. Uh, Jessica Shopoff with K-12 and I, it, kind of two-part question, are you currently tracking this, you know, understanding you don't have access to an entire state worth of data, but are you tracking this for your own students? Have you found a way to collect it? And then the second part you mentioned, NAEP you know, might be looking at this. Have you had conversations with any state departments or anybody who's especially interested in tracking it? Or is it, has it been kind of a brick wall of, of people that are like, yeah, we're not, we're not going to touch that? Got it. So in the latter, uh, I have not had formal conversations with state representative folks. So I have had conversations with uh, NAEP folks. I do think that there is genuine interest in including in some of the survey questions uh, questions I would get at this information. And I, and I, am, I am hopeful uh, that NAEP will uh, set the uh, precedent, which then makes it easier, again, gives states permission to start collecting this. Also, the data quality campaign uh, has uh, an, their report, which is called Show Me the Data, 
which um, assesses the reporting um, mechanisms for all 50 states. And it's this great report that, that both applauds and criticizes states for how they provide information about student achievement data. In their last report, they have all these critiques of all these states, but none of them say should these states should include family structure data. So I'm also trying to convince the, the DQC folks that they should um, start including this in their annual measurement of state, state achievement outcomes. Um, and then in, in terms of us collecting this information, so um, not formally, uh, but yes, we are definitely, um, and by the way, in our general context for how we track outcomes for all of our alumni. So we now have um, six classes of alumni. We have 500 alumni now in high school and in college. And we are spending a lot of time trying to understand what are the decisions that they're making, what are the decisions that they're facing, what's tough, what is it that they're experiencing as a senior in high school or a freshman in college, which should then inform what we're teaching back in eighth grade. Because this is the cycle. You know, we, all of this is coming from a place of ensuring our kids are as best prepared as possible to make the right decisions for their lives. Great way to finish. Please join me in thanking Ian Rowe for a fantastic presentation. Thank you, Ian. Awesome. All right, we're going to take a final. I'm Chugger Finn, happy to follow uh, Mike and a terrific, uh, a terrific uh, presentation by Ian. And we now move into the second half of the double header. Uh, anyone that has followed American politics or political science or political data or political thinking over the last uh, 30 or 40 years knows the work of Michael Barone. Uh, you have encountered the almanac of American politics. You have encountered his, uh, his writings, um, Washington Examiner, uh, AEI, any number of other publications. We were thrilled when he agreed to participate in the project. Uh, we gave him more or less free reign to pick a topic of interest to him. Uh, and to my personal delight, he picked uh, gifted education um, and a topic of considerable interest and enthusiasm to me. And the draft paper I read didn't have a whole lot of immediately political matter in it, uh, but it, was a, it is a very interesting discussion of the topic. And I promised to bring in some political matter during the question period that follows. Uh, and you may do likewise. Uh, without further ado, it's really an honor to introduce uh, Michael to this audience. Well, thank you very much, Checker. It's very nice uh, being here and very nice to uh, have heard the inspiring uh, talk of Ian Rowe and the work that he's doing. Thanks for what you're doing for people in New York and, and good luck for the future. Um, as Checker said, I don't fancy myself an expert on education. Uh, I'm at best a consumer or a former consumer of education rather than a producer uh, or a theorist. Um, but uh, it, my, people asked me in the elevator what was my expertise on education, and I said, well, I was educated. Uh, so let me, uh, let me start off in a way, we're going to be talking about gifted education about uh, is something in the nature of an autobiographical reminiscence. Um, I was born in the year 1944, very good year in my opinion. Um, on, on, on the day I looked it up that Franklin Roosevelt, Winston Churchill meeting in Hyde Park agreed they would not tell Joseph Stalin about the Manhattan Project and that they were developing an explosive weapon of great power. Um, interesting historical fact. Um, we had unfortunately had not had Fox News had not yet gone on the air, so I wasn't in, in able to comment uh, on that. Um, and uh, I entered kindergarten in 1949 in the Detroit public schools, which were then expanding. A dark green two-room temporary building in the outskirts, the farthest part of the city half a mile south of the uh, now famous Eight Mile Road. Every, everybody's heard of Eight Mile, is that? Okay, I was at seven and a half mile. Uh, and uh, the, as a kindergartner, I was count, counted in the 1950 census uh, as one of the 1,849,568 residents of the city of Detroit. It's all time high population. The, latest census estimate tells us it's down by 64 percent uh, to 673,104. Um, Detroit was then one of the nation's largest school districts. Student population peaked a few years later at almost exactly 300,000. 
Uh, that's not New York, but it's a, a large organization. Uh, today it's about 50,000 with about the same number uh, in charter schools. Um, and this was a period in history, I've, I've called it the mid-century moment, um, when we the peak era of what I have called in my book, Our Country, The Shaping of America from Roosevelt to Reagan, as big unit America, as a place where big government, a country where big government, big business, and big labor were widely trusted. Large bureaucratic organizations governed the workplace and school buildings of America. Uh, you've seen comment about the surveys that say Americans don't have confidence in institutions anymore, and they measure it against the backdrop of historic reference. Um, they, uh, th those surveys started in the early 1950s, in the mid-century moment, and we're always told, well, we don't have the confidence we used to have in institutions. Uh, one of my theories is that um, Americans for large parts of our history didn't have confidence in our institutions the way we did in circa 1950, that this was an unusual um, situation. And it was in part because the big institutions seemed to have done a terrific job. I mean, we got out of the Depression, we entered post-war prosperity when everybody predicted another Depression would be here. Um, and we, uh, we won World War II in sort of a big way. Uh, we were producing 50% of the economy of the world uh, about the time I entered kindergarten because so much of the world economy had been destroyed in the war. Um, and Americans crumbled about uh, bureaucracy and grumbled about the rigidity and the rules. And gripes about from the GIs uh, were famous. Um, but they were... Um, but they basically uh, trusted these large institutions and felt that um, the experts at the top of these institutions knew what was best and could produce good results. And um, the Detroit Public Schools was that kind of an institution. We had uh, uniform textbooks, spiral, uniform spiral notebooks, a standard curriculum, standard district-wide rules, um, and uh, all seemed well in that world. Um, I turned out to be kind of a poor fit in this system. Um, according to my mother's testimony, I'm not sure is fully uh, uh, credible, I, I was reading before kindergarten, uh, and she felt obliged to intervene repeatedly with my teachers and the principal's office so I could take more advanced books out of the school library. This was uh, a continuing struggle and resulted in me reading some adult books that I really where I could read all the words, but I had no idea about the reality of what they were describing. Um, and the, um, the rules did not encourage, they actively discouraged special treatment uh, for gifted and advanced students. This was, you were supposed to be part of the mass, part of the ordinary people, a small cog in a very large machine. Um, and in a historic perspective, if you went back a half a century before that, American high schools tended to uh, be geared to relatively gifted students with a pretty sophisticated curriculum. But of course, they were rather exclusive uh, institutions. Only about 5% of Americans graduated from high school in the first several decades or less of the 20th century. They had a sort of, they were supposed to have a sort of knowledge base that would be comparable to or in excess of what college graduates are expected to have today. Um, but it was un very unusual for a college, for a high school graduate to go on to college. It's one of the reasons that uh, I've written that uh, President Ronald Reagan was a, an unusual person because he graduated from uh, high school in 1929, parents that had never graduated from high school, and he went to college. That was really a weird thing for a person like that to do. And... It shows that he, in my view, that he had certain ambitions to be an important person uh, and achieve them against the odds. Um, but um, but as, the, as enrollment increased in schools, as we moved towards universal education in the 1920s and 30s, as high school enrollment expanded to include the vast majority of adolescents, um, and here I should note that I'm generalizing about this period. Um, it, my generalizations tend to all carry a sort of, keep in mind, a, 
an exception for black people because of the situation of segregation in the South and exclusion from school and so forth. And I hope you'll understand that these generalizations tend to have that exception historically. Um, but as high school enrollment expanded to include the vast majority, uh, the progenitors of progressive education um, thought focusing on the gifted uh, reeked of elitism. They promoted a sort of uh, egalitarianism, a curriculum which was accessible to the great mass of students, could be mastered relatively easy by the, easily by them. Uh, and this, uh, this supposed conflict, actually a tension between elitism and egalitarianism, was mostly re resolved by, uh, in favor of egalitarianism and leaving the gifted however defined, uh, to fend for themselves. Um, and so by the time I was in the third grade, my mother took the unusual step of exercising what we now call school choice and enrolling me in an elite suburban uh, school, private school. Um, and ultimately, my two sisters and I went to three different high schools, um, each with all superintended by mother, my mother, each of which we reflected suited us pretty well. We were early school choicers, um, two in public schools, one in private school, um, at a time when just about everybody went to the same public school, the district where your parents lived. My view is that uh, in that mid-century moment, uh, mass public education with no special approach to the gifted suited the temper of a nation which had won a world war with a military of 12 million men, with mass production of air hundreds, thousands of airplanes, ships, tanks, and jeeps. Um, the idea of mass movement, ma great masses of people working together under expert leadership um, had great heft in that period. Um, but the war was also concluded not by masses, but by brains. Uh, not with the one million American casualties estimated for an invasion of Japan. And I'm reminded by mention of Pat Moynihan that um, one of the things, he was born in 1927, he was an 18-year-old Navy uh, personnel in 1945. And as he put it, he says, I was scheduled to be in the invasion of Japan. Would have died. <laughs> Uh, he was off for the atomic bomb. Um, and uh, the, uh, the weapons that were developed by creative physicists, brilliant engineers, many of them refugees from Europe. Uh, and in the 1950s, as they went on, the Cold War seemed increasingly a battle of brains. Uh, as the Soviets developed an atomic bomb just a few years after we did, a hydrogen bomb just about the same time we did, rockets that seemed to shoot up in the stratosphere earlier and more reliably than ours at a time when uh, in the public schools you went to go under the seats uh, to do your nuclear weapons drills. How many remember that here? Okay, uh, this is, uh, and you know, I just looked at the calendar, the, years and said, well, First World War was followed 20 years later by a Second World War, so Third World War is due about 1965. Um, that was the mindset that was prevailing then. And the idea is that the country would, you know, that had the best uh, rocket engineers uh, may win. So there was a great uh, emphasis put on brains all of a sudden. And in October 1957, when the Soviets set up a rocket that put up the satellite, a Sputnik, into orbit around the Earth uh, before the United States had done so. There was something like panic in America, something like a sense that we were losing the battle of brains. We were losing the Cold War. Uh, President Eisenhower thought this was overwrought, and I think in retrospect he was probably right. But one of the effects of the Sputnik was that it made it seem suddenly necessary to make massive use of our gifted young people. Um, and that imperative registered at my private school in suburban Detroit. I was part of a class that took standard ninth grade courses in the eighth grade with a view towards beginning calculus and advanced science courses in the 11th and 12th rather than leaving them for college. Um, there were similar programs for students identified as gifted in elite central city schools, Bronx and Stuyvesant, uh, science in Stuyvesant, New York, Boston, Latin, 
uh, Central High in Philadelphia, Cass Tech in Detroit, and high schools, high-income suburbs like Scarsdale, Great Neck, New Trier, Mainline, and so forth. Uh, and in schools around the country, an emphasis on more rigorous curriculum geared particularly perhaps to science and tech, but also in other ways. Uh, and as one writer put it, the gift field of gifted education continued to evolve mainly in response to the changing needs of the country, especially after the Soviet Union's launch of the Sputnik in 1957. And federal funding was suddenly voted to direct it at gifted students in sciences and other subjects, selective colleges and universities, use standardized testing increasingly to identify gifted applicants uh, beyond the traditional uh, feeder schools that had all social register um, student bodies. Um, and national merit scholarships were started in 1955, contributed to this, the 1958 National Defense Act, the increasing use of standardized tests um, like the SAT uh, and ultimately the ACT uh, to try to identify gifted kids. Um, did these policies work? Um, I venture to say the answer is yes, but partially and only for a while. Um, the only year in American history that has been the birth year of three American presidents. Anybody know what the answer is? It's 1946, taken as the first, often as the first year of the post-World War II baby boom, that mid-century moment. Bill Clinton was born in August 1946, George W. Bush in July 1946, Donald Trump in June 1946. Uh, all went to elite colleges, different backgrounds, elite educations, um, all born about nine months after VJ Day, just saying. Uh, and all three members were members of the high school graduating class of 1964. The class that appears to have produced seven years after Sputnik the highest SAT scores in history. It was a peak. The Sputnik created this uh, emphasis on educating gifted children. And in fact, we got it even at the presidential level. Although there, there will be some argument about some of the individuals involved. Um, but the edu in my view, the emphasis on educating the gifted did not last. In the early 1960s, American elites and middle brow masses shifted their media, shifted their focus from foreign policy and the struggle with the Soviets. I remember we'd have school meetings and things and, um, and uh, beakers from outside the, the, the schools on this in the 1950s, very concerned about foreign policy. And we moved to domestic policy, and we moved to the need for economic and civil equality for black Americans especially, and for the poor generally. So you have the civil rights movement of Martin Luther King, led by Martin Luther King, and many other people risking their lives uh, and making for uh, great positive change in America. You had uh, the debut of the book Michael Harrington's The Other America, public excerpt that was reviewed in The New Yorker, I think, by... Uh, Dwight MacDonald, uh, that was uh, suddenly we sort of shift from foreign affairs, the chief subject in the Kennedy-Nixon debates in 1960, uh, to domestic affairs. And we shift um, from trying to educate people who are going to build the next rocket or provide the expertise about foreign policy and things of that nature to the idea of lifting up those who are disadvantaged. Um, and so forth. And um, in many ways, of course, this was a positive development in American history. But I think it had a negative effect on education for the gifted. Um, just as the goal, the progressives' goal of universal education tend to displace the goal of educating the gifted, so the goal of uplifting the disadvantaged um, tended to displace it uh, as well. American education, especially in those days when large percentages of schools of students were in very large big city uh, school districts still, these bureaucratic big unit organizations uh, or countywide school districts in the South, 
um, found it hard to uh, to adopt Lyndon Johnson's elegant phrase. America found it hard to walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, to do education for the gifted and do education for other uh, with other goals and targets. Uh, the Federal Aid to Education Act finally passed in 1965, uh, directed extra funding toward the disadvantaged on the theory. Uh, often stated, seldom vindicated that more money would produce better results. Uh, it had an ancillary effect because it did not include Catholic schools or private schools to reduce the Catholic and other traditional religious uh, networks of schools to smaller numbers. Um, and it, uh, the, the idea that more money would produce results, um, the, the argument was, hey, that worked to serve the children of the Ellis Island era immigrants, the immigrants and the great surge of immigration from 1892 to 20, 1924. Um, it was a goal much less often reached even as the teacher unions were leveraging spending upward as the Nation at Risk study concluded in 1983. Uh, similarly, No Child Left Behind passed in 2001. Bipartisan support had the explicit goals of eliminating the racial gap between blacks and whites. Um, and as Chester Finn and Amber North wrote in, in 2014, it ignored the educational needs of higher achievers. Um, Neglect of the gifted was one of the wrongs perpetrated on K-12 education during the NCLB, NCLB era, uh, the 2016 replacement ESSA. Do we call it ESSA? ESSA. ESSA. I don't know if that's an improvement. I'm <laughs> I'd want to test that the way they do when they name new brands of Japanese cars in multiple languages to make sure it doesn't say something you know, bad in some fairly widely spoken language. Um, and I think selective colleges, universities, high prestige selective private schools uh, may have reinforced this effect by the high priority they've placed on racial diversity, isn't it? Uh, their goal is to narrow the racial gap. The outcome has often been mismatch in the title of the Richard Sander and Stuart Taylor book, in which too many of the intended beneficiaries lack the preparation or ability to profit from the level of instruction which is prepared, pitched towards better prepared students. Um, in the meantime, gifted students capable of profiting from these programs who do not fit into the right, ratio, right racial classifications are in danger of being left behind. Uh, and I dare say this may be the situation in New York, I don't want to put Ian on the spot here, but uh, where uh, Mayor Bill de Blasio wants to replace selection by examination for Stuyvesant and Bronx Science and Brooklyn uh, Tech and uh, in favor of racial quotas and preferences. Um, a policy that I'm very much against, primarily because of the effect on the intended beneficiaries. Um, the situation. But the situation of many, most, probably most gifted students, is not as dire as it was in the early 1950s. Uh, giftedness is not spread randomly across the population. It crops up here and there uh, in, in clusters in some areas. It tends to be concentrated geographically and demographically. If you look at you know, where National Merit Scholarship people come from and so forth, uh, it's not a random selection around the country. Um, and uh, often in, it, it concentrated, but not totally, in upscale, high in education, high income parts of the uh, nation's uh, major metropolitan areas. Um, Democrats will point out to you these are the areas that have been particularly acerbic in rejecting Donald Trump. I'll just leave that aside uh, as an argument that you may or may not want to consider. Um, and the parents in this era of increasingly assortative ma ma marriage. Uh, that's a fancy phrase for people marrying similar people. And if you want illustrations of that, take a look any day at the uh, New York Times wedding announcements. You know, it, it's, it's all, uh, are likely to be well-educated, well-positioned to seek, as my mother did, uh, schooling for uh, gifted kids to achieve their full potential. Um, and we're also at a time when the historically large 
big city school districts like Detroit, I think not like New York is an exception, have shrunk in size and the majority of children grew up grow up in suburbs. Parents with some affluence and adeptness can, can, can choose the school district or the charter school or the private school they think most uh, suited to their child. Uh, we're not going back, as Mike Petrilli wrote, to the time when urban schools had the exclusive franchise to operate schools within their geographic boundaries, uh, and I might add to dictate what everybody uh, in their large school systems where it's going to learn. Uh, public charter schools now serve over 3 million students. Uh, they've got a constituency, and that's not going to be abolished today. So cultural variety, greater school choice, uh, these are trends that tend to make available appropriate education for the gifted. Uh, but there's a danger that many gifted children will remain in a lurch. Uh, those with parents insufficiently or, a, or one parent insufficiently appreciative of their potential or without the resources to uh, enable them to take advantage of it. Many kids in rural and small town areas, there are probably a lot of people that could ace the SATs uh, in some of these places and just don't bother to take them. Uh, those of disfavored ethnic groups, um, such a student was Charles Murray from Newton County, Iowa, who was admitted to Harvard in 1961 thanks to high SAT scores. And as he pointed out in his 2008 book, Real Education, a standardized test were developed in the 1950s in order to identify gifted students who would be otherwise overlooked by selective colleges, exactly the situation that he fitted into. Uh, today, I read that selective universities are actually considering dropping the requirement of taking standardized tests for applicants, um, perhaps because they're not helpful in maintaining racial quotas or preferences. Um, the more recent story, of, consider the story of J.D. Vance, in his 2016 best-selling book, Hillbilly Elegy, uh, was raised in a dysfunctional family in Middletown, Ohio, uh, was not prepared for college. Um, was uh, by high school. He was basically prepared by four years in the U.S. Marine Corps, uh, after which he was academically very successful at Ohio State uh, and Yale Law School. Um, Charles Murray, uh, J.D. Vance, that's anecdote, not data, I realize, and I haven't given you much data. Uh, Ian Rowe asked for more data. I'm not giving you very much at all here. Um, but anecdote, which raises for the question, at least for me, of whether America is doing as good a job at identifying and educating its gifted young men and women as it did in the years just after Sputnik. Now, that wake-up call, which only a few Americans today remember, uh, alerted a mostly culturally uniform nation, again with that great exception, the race issue, to cultivate its most gifted young people even while maintaining in those jam-packed big classrooms an egalitarian system determined to serve all. We were able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Today, in a nation of greater cultural variety, a wider array of choices, there is more leeway to give gifted children the education they need, but also maybe a greater danger that we're leaving too many of them unnecessarily behind. Thanks very much. Here. Thanks again. That was really interesting. and. Uh, and uh, provocative, too. Let me note that you don't do quite as good a Moynihan imitation as my friend the late Tim Russert did. Oh, right. Uh, nobody did, ever, yeah. uh, in history. Um, but I want to actually uh, pick up for a second on Moynihan, because not just because you mentioned it, him, and not just because he uh, was my own mentor, but because he was famous for saying that you can't deal with a problem until you can define and measure it. And we don't do a very good job of defining or measuring uh, gifted, giftedness uh, in America, partly because we have huge arguments, including within the gifted education community, over what it means to be gifted. You have sort of taken for granted in your remarks that gifted means smart, uh, which is not surprising, because that's what I think most people think. But every single state in the country has a different definition of giftedness from every other state. I've checked that one out. And there is a small federal program named after the late Jacob Javits, and I want to read you its definition of giftedness. It was a gifted child of the New York public school system circa 1910. 
And I think I actually cared about this stuff. Circa 1910, is he that right? He was born in 1904, so okay, kindergarten went to 1910, probably. Uh, so the Javits Act, uh, as it is called, uh, defines gifted students as those who show signs of, quote, high achievement capability in areas such as intellectual, creative, artistic, or leadership capacity, or in specific academic fields, unquote. Intellectual, creative, artistic, leadership, or specific academic fields. All of which, on its face, is plausible. But how in the hell do you measure the incidence of that kind of giftedness in the American population? And therefore, if you can't measure how many of them there are, how can you know whether you're serving them? It's a def I think I think you can improve uh, without definitively defining and mathematically measuring people, you can improve and you can look for different things. And maybe it is a feature, not a bug, that you're getting def different definitions in different states and people are struggling to come up with useful definitions of, of giftedness. Uh, I would say that, you know, at the mid-century moment, in, when America believed in big organizations and mass units, Americans also believed that to be average was good to be gifted was a little weird. I mean, in the political realm, President Eisenhower and President Reagan both ran for office as, hey, I'm just an ordinary guy with a smile, you know. Uh, you know, Eisenhower would um, answer reporters at press conferences with statements that seemed to be grammatically inconsistent and unrevealing. President Reagan ran for governor of California. He says, I'm just an average citizen, and so forth. The fact is that both Eisenhower and Reagan were really smart guys, mm -hmm. and they really knew a lot about a lot of things that are important for you to know as a president. Mm -hmm. They didn't want people to see him that way. In the mid-century moment, you didn't want to seem to be a, an intellectual, what was the, a brain or something like that. Yeah, and I think brain. today we're more open to seeing uh, people that are open to different, you know, that have capacity to do different kinds of excellence. And maybe we are more appreciative of more uh, kinds of excellence than we were 50 uh, or 70 years ago. But th maybe that's just my native optimism speaking. Um, maybe it is. Uh there's still a lot of sort of aw shucksness in the political system. I am a, I'm an ordinary guy from somewhere far away, and I'm going to clean up the mess in Washington, which is full of all these pointy-headed intellectual types. Uh, there was a, I don't know if you saw the column in the Times the other day by Russ Duthat, who wrote actually about how a, a, a aristocracy might be better than meritocracy for America in the present moment. Uh, by, by aristocracy, he was referring to the, what he called the wasp aristocracy, the sort of Bush, the kind of uh, George H.W. Bush wasp aristocracy. He said meritocracy uh, tends to congregate in particular places. It tends to uh, feel entitled. Uh, it, it, it may not be a good thing for America in the present moment. Giftedness obviously is associated with the notion of, of, of merit or at least an, an innate mm. potential. Uh, I wonder if, um, how well is meritocracy working in the United States at the present time and what does that do for our gifted education thinking? Well, I can't resist saying that Ross's last two books have been about um, Harvard and the Pope. So he's, uh, he's he looked at various kinds of aristocracy, if you will, um, <laughs> people at the heads of large organizations. Um, I think history will show that uh, different people of high intellectual ability behaved with uh, different degrees of wisdom over time. And that one of the things smart people really should try and figure, learn in the course of their work is that being smart is not necessarily being wise. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the founding generation was a bunch of, you know, really amazing smart people that turned out to be very wise about many things, not mm. everything. Um, you know, the, 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 the generation of Clay, Calhoun, and Webster 
uh, didn't leave us uh, all the problems solved in America at all. We ended up having a civil war. So, um, you know, and then you had Abraham Lincoln, who never would have been founded, gift, found gifted by any school he attended because he had only one month of formal education. Um, You're right. But it's, yeah, it, it's an imperfect search, but I think, uh, you know, we... we the financial collapse of 2008, the unsatisfactory, at least for many, conclusions of the wars in Iraq and things in the 2000s um, have soured people on experts. on experts and people that did well to get admitted to high prestige selective colleges and universities. Um, yeah, I could argue that goes back to sort of McNamara and Vietnam, too. The notion that the the best and the brightest uh, don't always produce uh, happy outcomes for the uh, country they live in. Yeah, and they were they were great quantifiers. They were yeah. the people that were managing the big units. Yeah, and got reports on numbers, um, but they didn't understand the hearts of people on the ground very so well. The twentieth century history. That you numbers are just clues. They're numbers not... are clues. Okay. The history you recounted uh, was kind of cyclical from a kind of uh, acceptance of uh, giftedness in the early 20th century uh, through a kind of progressive democratization, egalitarianism, back to uh, almost a need for giftedness in the Sputnik era, followed by sort of civil rights, war on poverty, egalitarianism again. You began to hint that we might be in another phase of this, uh, this, this sine wave. Uh, with a little more attention to it now, if 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 so, does it have to do with international competitiveness, economic stuff? Uh, what would be the, or is it simply that we've we've now got more choices and more openness, and people can uh, be different from each other uh, more than they could be? If we're on another phase of this of this cycle, why? Uh, well, I think you know, I think there was an unusual degree of cultural uniformity in the period of. 1930s, the World War II, especially the decade thereafter, mm -hmm. um, again, with the exception always of the position of black Americans, mm -hmm. the, most of them living in segregation, although they were in the process of fleeing southern segregation to go to northern discrimination. Um, and that was unusual. Mm -hmm. American, you know, we, we hear all the time that American history is... Uh, we were just a white bread country with no diversity, and suddenly we have diversity. Hey, we've always had diversity. Go to colonial New Amsterdam, <laughs> consider the name, that had, you know, that had Dutch, uh, Brit English, uh, Jews. They didn't let the Scots in. But it was, uh, you know, we've, we've been a... And, and, and it's the Founding Fathers appreciated this. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what a lot of the things in the Constitution are about. They were close enough to the previous century to know that their religion was a mainspring of horrible wars in Europe and a British Civil War and so forth. And they put in the Constitution that there will be no religious test for office. Mm -hmm. There was in England, mm -hmm. Britain. Uh, you had to be a member of the ch established church. They put in that the, in the, in the First Amendment um, the Congress shall make no law regarding an establishment of religion. They, because they knew they had Congregational Calvinist New England, Anglican Virginia, mm -hmm. um, South Carolina and Rhode Island with their seaports and Jewish populations. Maryland they, was Catholic. Maryland was run by Catholics, but was mostly non-Catholics. Right. It was kind of right. a mixed I have to get us back to gifted education. And, and Quakers, uh, well, the Quakers give us... Selective schools, okay, ah. Pennsylvania. But that's they, they knew that it was a diverse country, and they, they dealt with it accordingly. So American egalitarianism is uh, very squirrely in that we're very good at giving special educational treatment to some populations. Uh, the most obvious uh, and, and, and visible are kids with disabilities. Uh, who get uh, special programs, special funding, special rules, special schools, special rights, um, and we're willing to treat them as special. Uh, but we don't do the same for smart kids. It's very, well, the, the, the special ed is real expensive, isn't it, Checker? I mean, you know much more about this than I do. My understanding is it costs piles of money 
Yeah, it's about 13 percent. Nationally, it's about 13 percent of the kids and north of a quarter of the budget. Yeah, which is double per capita, yeah. roughly. It's, um, I, on the one hand, I think probably some of it is a boondoggle, and on the other hand, I think some of it is probably um, a, a, a generous and wise investment by an affluent society in trying to equalize the situation of a lot of people in a way that would never have been possible before in history. With, I don't disagree with any of that, but what is it in our sort of political culture or definition of uh, e e equality that uh, allows special treatment for some and not for others who are different in other ways? I think that what's happened is that we have uh, we have sort of increased the array of choices, and, and not just in the way of, of what the label of school choice is, mm -hmm. but have diminished the degree to which centralized bureaucracy, national bureaucracy, uh, has control over people. So that, mm -hmm. as I said, many of many parents of gifted kids have plenty of ways to get them. Um, to get them the education. There are more National Merit Scholars in Hamilton County, Indiana than in Marion County, Indiana. Marion County is the central city of Indianapolis. Hamilton County is the highest income suburbs. But it has also, about a quarter of the population. But your very point underscores a problem, which uh, you alluded to at the end of your remarks, which is that there's a very substantial number of equally smart kids from disadvantaged circumstances, from poor families, uh, from uh, poorly educated families who, 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 who live in districts and schools that don't do these things and have, don't have parents who do these things for them. Uh, and if they're going to be sort of have their talents cultivated, the education system has, has to deal with it or, or, or special programs or private benefactors. We just uh, lost uh, a week or so ago. Uh, Harold Levy, who ran the Jack Kent Cooke Foundation, which is one of the major funders of private scholarships for um, highly able poor kids, um, and a very and a, and a very good thing. Uh, but uh, what do we do if the society is separating itself into enclaves of prosperous, educated people who can afford to find good schools for their smart kids, and another population of people who can't do that for their equally smart kids? I'm reminded of one of my favorite Perry Mason episodes when the, um, Perry proves, as usual, that his client didn't do the murder. Of course not. And the district attorney, Hamilton Berger, comes up to him and says, well, Perry, client didn't do the murder, and so forth. Who did? And Perry says, he says, I don't know. He says, that's your job to find out. Uh, <laughs> so you're throwing so, this one back at me. Well, you got a foundation here that, uh, you know, you've been doing a lot of work on this for a long time and very good stuff. I, you know, it's, uh, my basic philosophy is that fail-safe systems, big centralized systems, are sure to fail in some ways. And that uh, decentralized systems and a lot, of, a lot of avenues and choices will also fail in some ways. And I don't have data to quantify that. Um, or re any real sense of it, but I think that's where we are in history. We are um, a peacetime society. I mean, the, 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 the mid-century moment was created by war. You had 15 million Americans, men mostly, mm -hmm. who were in the military service during World War II. That was in a country of 131 million in 1940. Mm -hmm. That was, and how many were in the defense industries? Mm -hmm. A few m millions more. We were all, you had rationing of food, you had rationing of all sorts of items. You didn't have, you know, want to buy a new car? There are no new cars, um, and so forth. Uh, that was a nation that was brought together in a war that had unusually low levels of dissent. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. we always think of wars, hey, Things American people about. united about wars. It turns out most of the wars America's had people... You know, read Lincoln on the Mexican War, or General, or Grant, who was in the military then, um, and so forth. So that's we were unusually united, unified, confident it, that leadership, centralization, bureaucratization was going to win. And by God, we had just won, won some big ones. And I'm about to open this up, but I got a, a, one or two more questions. The gifted education 
has not had many political champions at either the national level or the state level. Uh, it's one of the reasons that the Javits bill is the only federal thing I can cite, and that goes back uh, several decades uh, to its enactment. And uh, Javits has been out of the Senate for, you would know lot better than I. Since 1980. All right, lost, 1980. lost Al D'Amato. All right, thank you. I knew you'd know that. Sublime, uh, ridiculous. Um, so is it because of the sort of aw shucks populism of American politics that it's better to not be seen as a champion of something that could be called elitist? Uh, why don't we have any, any, any political leaders who want to make this their issue? Um, it would seem like bragging. Yes, well, this is, you know, what George Bush's, uh, the late President George Bush's mother, Dorothy Walker Bush, would call him up. Don't talk about says, yourself? Yeah, don't brag. We don't brag. That's not polite. Now, they had this huge, you know, her father had built this huge, massive house in Maine. He also had a massive plantation in South Carolina. He owned a big house on Sutton Place in New York. He was a great investment banker, and he endowed the Walker Cup Golf Championship. <laughs> Um, but we don't brag, um, and you know this. That it's, was part of the wasp aristocracy too. That was part of the wasp aristocracy. Other people uh, brag and so forth. But it's it, it. You know, I think partly, part of it is just the thought that you know what, gifted people are going to do pretty well on their own. You're talking about people whose incomes uh, and prospects uh, for a pleasant career are pretty darn good when you think about it, having work that you like. A lot of people in this country honorably go to a job that they dislike five times a week, and they get up at 6.15 in the morning to do it, and they raise their family, and they be good citizens, and they contribute to their church and everything like that. But by God, it's kind of, there are a lot of unpleasant times about it, and there used to be a whole lot more people that lived lives yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and if you're a gifted person, I think the world is just that much more pleasant in many ways. The work you do, what you can learn and everything. Um, well, I'm going to argue that that is tr potentially the case for all you, gifted people. If you know the 1950 census populations of all major cities, what could be more enjoyable? <laughs> Um, you too could uh, work for the Almanac of American Politics if you can if you if you can pull that off. But again, to repeat myself, if it, the giftedness of those who were born with an opportunity or in circumstances that enable them to call it, develop it, I agree with you about. Um, and, and also the exceptions, the J.D. Vances who managed through a kind of bootstrapping or a happenstance or a drive or something to basically escape the circumstances in, in which they were born. Um, but uh, we look around at what some research has called the excellence gap at a fair number of equally talented people from disadvantaged circumstances who just um, could but don't have the chance. Uh, and they probably end up in jobs that are arguably even more frustrating because they're, they're too smart for their job, but they're stuck in it. So, they may uh, take up avocations. <laughs> okay. I'll think of, well, I guess... If we're going to go to the audience, we are. I, would, I would cite the example of my father's uncle, Tony, who my father was right. a doctor. His father was a doctor. He was from a family that immigrated from Sicily in the 1890s. He was the only one sent to medical school. Uncle Tony lived alone with his probably um, retarded sister. He, had, uh, he worked in a factory in Detroit, as the other brothers did, go work in a factory. And he built a greenhouse and had a cactus collection in the backyard. <laughs> now, in what Detroit. is in Detroit, yes. which is like not the best climate you for would cactus? Think. I remember being in that greenhouse. Um, he must have. Why would he do that? He must have got a great pleasure and have had a great deal of knowledge about the cactus thing. So far as I know, he didn't share that with anybody. Certainly not anybody now alive. But. Um, he found the satisfaction that way. He was probably a pretty smart guy. So he found it something that was not his daily job, something that he could uh, apply himself to, his brain to. Uh, yes, okay. while he was staying at home, taking That's care of his sister, yeah. and so forth. Audience, microphones, gentlemen here. You are who? Uh, my name is David Nitkin. I work at a network of public charter schools here in Washington, D.C. called Two Rivers. 
Um, thank you for the remarks. They were very, very interesting. I, I wonder if at this mid-century moment, part of the rationale for investing in gifted education was the assumption that the gifted would be engaged in national service for the national good, helping to overcome communism. And in contrast, today, our assumption is that people who are gifted graduate from Harvard or Stanford and become bankers or work at white shoe law firms or become tech billionaires. If America is less interested right now in investing in the gifted, could part of the reason be that the gifted seem less interested in investing in America? Mm. And if so, what do we do about that? Mm. Well, I think part of your answer, the short answer to your question is yes. Uh, the, the larger answer revolves around the fact that we thought, you know, 1957, we thought we were in a war and that it could be a hot war and that weapons development could make the difference between victory and defeat, you know. Um, I mean, Japan had lost, okay? Uh, and, uh, and, and so there was a sort of urgency um, thought about that. Um, we don't... So the international but, competitiveness doesn't compare in urgency. It doesn't compare in urgency. Now, you know, the theories that many people spun that um, finance does something positive for an economy, for a country, and make, I, I actually believe in some of that. Some of it's obviously, you know, sounds suspiciously self-serving coming from some people. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, I mean, some years ago, I, went, somebody, I was talking to somebody who was at Goldman Sachs, and I sort of said, what do you do with Goldman Sachs? I said, you know, it sounds like something I could do maybe and make a lot of money. He was not, did not give me an illuminating answer. Um, but I think it, part of it is the difference between wartime and peacetime. Wartime the different peacetime. wartime, you, you know, it, it, the memory of the world wars. In 1957, we were, what, um, 40 years from 1917 when America entered World War I. 20 years later, 20 some years later, we were in World War II. Um, what, what was 40 years ago from today, 1978? Uh, Jimmy mm. Carter. Jimmy Carter. The time that many of us in Inflation. this room remember and think of as reasonably familiar. Some of you don't. Um, yeah, it was, it, it, it was the, 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 searing, the, the searing nature of the war and the way that war gets you into that. And, you know, you were. You have a war like World War II, you really want to win it. It's like, a, you know, like 100 million people died. What's your opinion that gifted programs were hurt in the 1970s and 80s when many school districts in the South used them for basically to segregate blacks and white students, just like uh, the nice ring counties around Washington, D.C. use AP and IB to do exactly the same thing. And also, is gifted programs hurt today because they're so dominated by Asian immigrants? Stuyvesant's 70 percent Asian. T.J. in Fairfax County, 70 percent Asian. Mountain Vista High School in Cupertino is like 90 percent Chinese. Why would anyone want to care about a program where their kids have no chance to get into it? Well, um, who are you, by the way? Uh, Jason with nobody. Jason with nobody. Okay. Well, you're with all of us. So, uh, <laughs> whether we agree with your point of view or not, the um, well, that's that's sort of part of the political parameters, I suppose. I mean, you're uh, you know summoning up even you know the South thing that you cite. There's a difference between that and segregation, which is enforced by which is total and that which is separating groups which are, you know, disproportionately of different racial groups. And, and very visibly in, in, in the South example, you write very starkly. Um, but enforcing segregation by force of law and by threat of violence and so forth, which was the Southern system. The threat people could be killed for trying to register to vote. It happened. Um, the, you know, it, that's a different sort of thing. Um, I think, you know, whenever you have sort of ability grouping, and this is one of the, you know, the balance between elitism and egalitarianism, um, I think, you know, and people fight this idea very hard, but the psychology discipline is proving this uh, at the genome level. Um, 
the, the things were that, say, the standardized test test for are not randomly distributed among people of different varying ancestries and backgrounds. They're clustered. They're like other physical traits, like inherit, all inheritable traits. Um, and, you know, uh, so you have, uh, you know, you have, you, 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 we, we have this assumption that is rooted in the racial quotas and preferences that in a fair society, every group would be absolutely equally represented in every occupation, every school, thing like that. I just think that's nonsense. I think what we want to have are fair systems that open the way for people and that I think we want to make a special effort for people to find people who are especially um, appropriate for certain settings to find their way into that setting. Um, you know. Um, we don't have time today to deal with standardized testing, but that what you just said is part of the reason that people like de Blasio don't want standardized tests to be the admissions basis for uh, uh, the, hit the schools in New York. I think basically, you know, um, you know, on, on Stuyvesant, Brock Science, Cupertino, I think we always need more Einsteins uh, to use a different ethnic group, but one of which where there were quotas and preferences against from the 1920s to the 1960s at many selective inst colleges and other institutions. And uh, I, I, I think, uh, you know, nobody is barred by force of law from Cupertino High School. Um, it has sorted itself out to be what it is. We are out of time. I'm being told to stop. So uh, let me tell everybody here that if you would like to rejoin us on January 9th in the same place at the same time, Ramesh Panaro and Mona Charan will be our doubleheader that day. Oh, and they will be well worth uh, listening to and talking with. So please come back in the new year. Uh, have a happy holiday. And before you leave, join me in thanking Michael Barone again. Thank you. Thank you.